Welcome to Playwright to Playwright, an online interview series presented by Queen's Theatre. You are listening to the audio description pre-show notes for the interview. Because the format is fairly simple and the talking is continuous, there will be no audio description during the interview itself. The video begins with a title screen. The Queen's Theatre logo fills up the left side of the screen. The logo resembles the letter Q. The circle of the letter Q is orange and the rectangular tail is black. The text of the title screen reads, Playwright to Playwright with Rob Urbanati and special guest Rajiv Joseph, originally recorded December 7, 2020. Technical production, J. Rogers. The Queen's Theatre at Home text logo is in the lower right corner of the frame throughout the interview. The word Queen's is in orange and the word theatre is in black. The interview consists of close-ups of Rajiv and Rob in large squares filling a split screen with Rajiv on the left and Rob on the right. At times, when Rajiv is speaking, a close-up of him fills the screen. Rob is in his 60s, with close-cropped dark hair and a round face. Rob is in his living room and wearing a black t-shirt with the Queen's Theatre logo on it. Rajiv has short dark hair and an oval face. He's wearing a black hoodie over a gray t-shirt and is using white earphones. He's sitting in front of bookshelves. Hello, and thank you for joining us for Episode 7 of Playwright to Playwright. Today, I have the distinct honor of talking with Rajiv Joseph. Rajiv had some of his earliest works produced at Queen's Theatre and has gone on to considerable success, creating a remarkable body of plays that I'm eager to talk with him about today. Hey, Rajiv, how are you doing? Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, in my apartment in New York City. And where does this find you? I'm in my apartment in Cleveland, um, even though I, I live in New York still, but I, I have this little place here in Cleveland near my parents, and I've been spending most of the uh, pandemic here. Excellent. Um, well, maybe we can start there, not with the pandemic, but with um, your parents and your background. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about your background, your mixed race, how that influenced your writing in any way? Sure, sure. Um, my I grew up in Cleveland. Um, and uh, I have a younger brother who is also an artist. He is um, a classical musician. He plays percussion for the Buffalo Philharmonic and also um, owns his own percussion mallet company. And he creates uh, uh, beautiful high-end mallets for percussion. And, um, and my dad is from India. Uh, he's from Kerala in India. And he came to the United States when he was about 18. My mother is from the west side of Cleveland, um, which was then a, a rural part of Cleveland. Now is not so much, but um, uh, grew up around here. And um, we, my, my brother and I grew up here. My parents uh, exposed us to the arts at an early age, music, theater, dance, um, film. And we both kind of took to it. And um, my brother actually took to it much uh, at an earlier age than I did, he, from an early age, knew he wanted to be an orchestral musician, um, which is strange for like a first grader, but uh, it kind of worked out for him. He ended up going to Juilliard. Uh, I took a little longer on my journey. I, um, I did some theater as a kid, but I never, I never anticipated the theater being my, you know, my, my, my profession or my vocation. Um, but I, I liked writing, and I, I liked being creative, and then when I went to college, I majored in creative writing in English, thought I'd be a novelist. Um, and then I, I went to the Peace Corps after college and um, had a, quite an adventure there and um, really changed my life, changed the way I think about things, the way I look at things, and um, in many ways really made me into a writer because I, I, it was the first place where I, I started to establish a routine of writing, uh, a discipline. And through that experience and through the sort of um, incredible opportunity to be so far out of one's comfort zone uh, in a distant rural village in West Africa, in Senegal, um, I, my kind of my mind and imagination, I think, really opened up there. And after that, I came and moved to New York. And a few years later, I was going to NYU's Tisch School of the Arts uh, dramatic writing program. What was your first play? Because I know that your connection with Queen's Theatre happened um, very early on in your career. Yeah. Um, my first play was called Huck and Holden, and I wrote it at NYU. And it was actually based a little bit on a story my father told me about himself when he first came to this country, um, about a young Indian student um, who has to read um, 
is a business student but has to read uh you know Huckleberry Finn and Catcher in the Rye and how that how those books kind of sh changed him and um I have one of my best friends from the Peace Corps it's this guy named Brian Hooker and he has probably been to every single production of a play of mine and his absolute favorite experience of seeing a play of mine was at Queen's Theater in the Park. He still wow. talks about it. He came to that reading. It was my first public reading of my career after grad school. You guys did Huck and Holden. And we had basically a full, it was all on a Saturday. We got there early in the morning. We rehearsed all day. And about with about like an hour before the dinner break, my, my buddy Brian arrived. He was driving down from Boston where he was living at the time. He drove in and he came into the auditorium and he watched like the last hour or so of rehearsal. Then he had dinner with all of us. You guys had a nice like, you know, dinner for us there. And then me and the cast and Brian all went out to the park and like played football for like an hour. <laughs> and then came back in and did this public reading that was packed and, um, and went over like gangbusters. It was like this incredible show and it, I think it was, you know, it was his first time ever seeing anything of mine, any writing of mine performed. It was my first time in, as a professional, having even like a semi-professional reading. And, um, you know, he's seen my stuff on Broadway and he was like, yeah, it's all right. It's not as good as Queen's Theater in the Park. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. It makes me really happy. I love that play. And now when nice. I look at it in terms of the, you know, really the scope of your career, it does seem like a grad school play and i don't mean that pejoratively but i can see that that would be the first play you'd write um coming out of that yeah we have packed houses and food at queen's theater where yeah we're famous for our uh, <laughs> dinner spreads i'm glad you remember them oh yeah we also did uh the north pool a play that i loved um yeah a completely different style than huck and holden a you know a thriller very mm -hmm. sort of tight and intimate um and then we were involved with Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo. Yeah, in and a pretty pretty big way. Yeah, this was a play that I was, you know, fanatic about. I think mm -hmm. I was sending you emails or talking to you about how um, how I thought it was a major American play um, way back when. But I'd love to hear you talk about the evolution of the play because it started, correct me if I'm wrong, at Lark Play Development Center and ultimately with a pit stop at Queen's Theater ended up on Broadway. Can you talk about how the play um, changed during its developmental phases? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's interesting that that play actually started in, in grad school at NYU. Um, it started in 2003 um, as a 10 minute play. I wrote it. I wrote the first scene thinking it was just a, a standalone 10 minute play. Um, I submitted it to the 10 minute play festival at NYU and it did not get selected. And uh, and everyone of my teachers and classmates who who read it didn't get it, I guess. And um, and so I thought, oh, I think this is good, but I, you know, I was I was young and I was like, oh, this must not be very good. So I just put it into a, my desk drawer and forgot about it. But through the course of my the next year of my life, I whenever I was like just sitting around and not writing and you know procrastinating, I would take it out and I'd read it. And I just started really, I was like, I think this is good. And, and, and then I got this, you know, fellowship at the Lark Play Development Center where I became part of their playwriting workshop where every two weeks on a Monday night, you come in with just a few pages of a new script. And so my first day there, I was like, I'm going to bring in this. And then I thought, maybe I can expand this. Maybe it's not a 10 minute play. Maybe this is the first scene of a longer play. And so I brought it in and immediately everyone in the room at the Lark like just jumped out of their seats and they were like, this is great. And I remember that David Ives, who is the master of the 10 minute play, um, was in the, was, was there as the co-host with Arthur Copet that night. And he told me this is a perfect 10 minute play. And I was like, well, it didn't get into the competition. How did it get into the competition? Um, and uh, because of the sort of support of the Lark artists, chiefly Arthur Copet, John Eisner, David Ives, um, and, and, a, and a number of other artists there who were really encouraging to me and um, and guided me. I I started putting that 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 play together, and I um, I would just bring in a new fifteen pages every couple of weeks and hear it. And you know, many of those fifteen pages just didn't ever get written. And I had characters that I cut out and characters that I added, and um, 
eventually the Lark did what they call a bare bones production. And that, that production also is the, what we moved to Queens Theater at the park. And, um, and so that was, that was several years in the making. I mean, that was, that was quite a few years, I think like three or four or five years before it got to that point. But I always, you know, had, you know, through you and through John Eisner at the Lark felt like there were people that really cared about this. And then meanwhile, we couldn't get it done anywhere. Like my agent was sending it out to every theater in New York and every theater in the country. And even like, you know, one theater in San Francisco brought me out, flew me out there like three times to do readings of it and then passed on it. And um, I was like, man, once again, it's like, it seems that only some people get this and then some people don't. And, but then finally a center theater group at, in Los Angeles got it. <laughs> and they decided to do it at the Kirk Douglas Theater in Culver City. And, um, and that's when we brought on Moises Kaufman um, the you know legendary playwright and director to direct it who immediately was taken by it which i was lucky by and we put together this incredible cast it did really well at, at the kirk douglas they center theater group decided to bring it to the mark taper forum the next year we did it there the following year that year it became a, a pulitzer finalist in drama and then the following year we um managed to attract the talent of robin williams who starred as the Tiger, and it came to Broadway at the Richard Rogers Theater, um, where it you know played for a limited engagement, and um, you know was sort of the uh, the highlight of my career, I'd say. I was so proud of you when that mm -hmm. production moved to Broadway, but I was already really proud of you before. <laughs> um, in nice. terms of the development, was there a major change that happened in the course of those three years you mentioned? With the play, or would you say they were all sort of minor dramaturgical? They were major. They, they, they were major. I mean, I, the, we had, um, I expanded the play quite a, quite a bit between the first production in Los Angeles. Well, I mean, it was a totally different play from the Bare Bones that was in the Lark and at Queens Theater in the Park than what happened at the Kirk Douglas. It was, it, it changed enormously. And a lot of that change had to do with Moises Kaufman's uh, uh, guidance. Um, his vision for how the play should be staged really uh, in a, positively impacted my, um, the, the dramaturgy of the play, you know? And so that was the first huge leap. And then um, the second leap was in between the, the first production at the Kirk Douglas and the, and the second one, I decided, oh, there's, there's a lot of room to expand this. And so I, I ended up creating a whole new beginning of the second act, and I also changed the ending. And for that second time around at the taper, suddenly we couldn't find, figure out an ending. And we were, I was bringing in like three or four or five endings a day into rehearsal and we'd rehearse them all and then talk about them. And the actors by this point were very engaged and very connected to the piece. And we got into really, a lot of like passionate and heated discussions because sometimes I would bring in something and it would upset them. And they would be like, this isn't the ending. This is, this is a small ending for a big play and you need to do better, you know? And I, I really valued that in the end, like being taken to task by my like, fellow artists in this project that they cared so deeply about it. And um, I'm very proud of the ending that we have. And it, but it took, it took multiple, multiple, multiple drafts and even multiple um, iterations on the stage in front of an audience during previews. And so we had a different ending for every single one of our preview performances the second time around in Los Angeles, um, which was exciting and also terrifying. It's fascinating to me, you use the words in terms of being taken to task by your collaborators, um, a small ending for a big play. I think that play and a lot of your later work that we're gonna discuss really combines intimacy with epic scope. Um, can you, first of all, do you accept that characterization and can you <laughs> talk about that a little bit? I guess in terms of Bengal Tiger and then we'll talk about it in more detail with some of your later plays. I mean, I, I, I certainly accept that. I, I think that that's a lovely way of describing that play and some of my other plays. Um, I, I don't know if I have a exact, you know, kind of process that, that, that leads to that end. Um, but I believe that like when, when I feel that something is clicking at, at, at in a piece of writing, um, it's, it's because of the, like, the, the the characters and like the the, the interpersonal um, 
relationships that are operating, even if they're even if the backdrop is large. So, like in the case of Bengal Tiger, there's this not just the Iraq War and Americans there and and Iraqis there, but also like this ghost world happening. You know that that there's there's ghosts wandering the streets, and it's you know I've always characterized it more of a ghost story than a war story, but. Um, but the the issues at hand in, in each of the scenes are generally almost mundane to the point of um, you know uh, obs- you know like you know it's like that fine line between you know the obscene and the sublime you know like what I the, the scene in that play that I find is that, that I'm most proud of is the scene where this one soldier who has lost his hand. Um, is trying to get a hand job from a prostitute, an Iraqi prostitute, and he's he's had to enlist the 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 use of a translator to explain exactly what he wants done, and it's this it's this obscene, you know, act and really like degrading moment in a, in a way, but it also opens up the whole psychology of the character, and um, and introduces the the. The, the notion of like a phantom limb, which is a part of like, which is also like a ghost, and um, and the way that that scene operates in in both like the very very personal and and um, almost embarrassing moments of a of a person's life, um, juxtaposed with like a larger kind of um, almost religious structure, um, is something that I'm really drawn to. You know, I see what you mean. It's a really interesting way of putting it. It's like the intimacy. Ex- explains or informs the the larger themes and larger scope of the play. And right. I think that's true of the later work. So you are off and running um, career-wise pretty soon after that, um, after your experiences at Queens Theater. And one of the plays of yours that I really liked that I saw um, second stage um, was Gruesome Playground Injuries. And I keep bumping into it. I've gone to various Kennedy Center American College theater festivals or have been in various towns where it's playing. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's one of your most frequently produced plays. And it's such a strange piece that I'm wondering a few things. First of all, um, if you could just describe the play a little bit, but also why you think it's so successful and where you came up with this um, really curious idea. Sure. I mean, Gruesome Playground Injuries is probably the play that I wrote the fastest. It kind of came out of me, boom, like um, uh, in a in a sort of fever. And and then it was also the play of mine that was immediately, you know, found interest. Like the 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 day that my agent sent it out, two theaters wanted to do it immediately, two major regional theaters, and soon after that, second stage in in New York. And so. I've always um, I've, I've always felt it a, a very deeply personal piece. It's about two people, about Doug and Kayleen, um, a, a, a guy and a girl, and, and it takes place over 30 years of their life, and it jumps around in time at these different ages. It begins when they're eight years old, and it goes until they're 38, but it goes, it's not linear. And these the moments in their life are are like are the moments I explore in these in the play are moments of um, where where one of them or both of them. Having have encountered some sort of either physical or psychic injury, and how those injuries connect them, and um, the idea came to me when I was actually having drinks in New York with an old friend of mine that I'd known most of my life, and but he started explaining to me his his various injuries of his life, which were crazy, and you know it and made me wonder how he was still alive, and also how I didn't know about all these injuries, and I made the remark that like if he wrote a memoir. He could, um, he could, he could have every chapter be an injury, and that that made me think. Oh, what if there was a a story about that about people? And then I, the the you know kind of the guiding question of that play is like, why do we sometimes hurt ourselves to gain the affection or attention of someone else? And that was what um, that play kind of was about. And I think it's it persists among um, especially college aged audience because it's it, there are good roles for young actors. It's a challenging play. It's emotional. And um, and I think it's you know from a productive production standpoint, it's it's a fairly you know bare bones play. You 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 can do it with with very little, and um, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, you should be. And I was at a talk back at one of those KC ACTF um, productions, and um, 
not only the actors um, were in tears, but some of the audience was. The, as you say, it's a really emotional play, a really moving one. Um, and um, I love it. Um, I'd like to talk, um, if we could, to some degree at length, about your um, two of your most recent plays. Uh, I had the you know great luck to um, see them at the Atlantic, which is the closest theater to my house in New York. Nice, I yeah. Room at intermission to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I saw them both twice, which was great. And um, I find them in some ways of a piece, although they're nothing alike. They're drastically different. But um, let's talk about Guards at the Taj first. So. Uh, again, it's it's just helpful because I assume knowledge on the part of the listeners, but if you could just describe what the play is a bit, and then I have a few questions for you. But also, I know it's a funny question, where did you get the idea for this? But I'm selfishly interested in writers' <laughs> inspirations because that's a brilliant idea for that play. Um, Thank you. And also, I'd like to talk about it in terms of the intimacy and the sort of epic scope in the background of that play. But Guards at the Taj. Yeah, um, Guards of the Taj is, is is the play of mine that I I am the closest to um, in terms of like my own personal relationship with it. Um, it's a two hander uh, about two imperial guards in Agra in India in the 1600s. Um, they're standing guard one night, the night the dawn of when the Taj Mahal is going to first be revealed. Um, the the the, there's there's a lot of legends and mythology connected to the Taj Mahal. Um, I was able to visit the Taj when I was ten years old, and was told a lot of these stories then, and they've kind of they stuck with me through the years. And um, one, you know, a couple of the the legends. One is that you know it was built within this gigantic scaffold so that no one could see it until it was completed, and it took about thirteen or sixteen years, depending on you know who you ask, um, to build. And so. These two guards are standing there wondering what they're about to see because no one has seen it and they won't see it until it's done. And it's supposed to be the most beautiful thing in the world. And then another one of the legends associated with the guards with, with the Taj Mahal is that it was so beautiful that the emperor Shah Jahan um, wanted, you know, that that nothing so beautiful would ever be built again. And so he had the laborers and artisans who made it um, line up to have their hands chopped off. And um, and that is may or may not be true it's it's a legend and that 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 sort of legend um kind of drifts through time and space so there's a there's a similar legend with saint basil's cathedral in moscow there's a similar legend um you know with with other historic you know architectural wonders and um so i i wonder if it's less you know exactly true and and more has to do with a sort of collective um you know uh curiosity or amazement at you know at, at 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 what these things you know how these things were built and sort of like maybe the amount of misery that goes into building them the human misery um but anyhow it's um it's 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 an interesting play for me because it's um even though it takes place in the 1600s there's a sort of contemporary language to it um they they it's basically just two old friends two guys who are talking and who love each other but have different views of the world and as the play begins and and and, and proceeds their world views tear them apart and so um in many ways it says it's a it's a tragic play and um i think i had wanted to write a play about the taj mahal for a long time and i had started a play when i was in grad school or right after grad school and it was a real mess of a play and it was about it was like 10 people and four acts and just a big unwieldy mess and i realized after a draft or so that it was it was a mess and i abandoned it but then i came back to it because i was like you know the only thing i like about this thing are the two smallest characters because i had placed two guards on either side of the stage who just stood there the whole time but in between scenes would kind of whisper to each other and i was like these guys are funny everyone else sucks why don't I just get rid of everything except for them and see what I'm left with? And that's what that's what led me towards this play. That was a, a brilliant idea. Of course, I didn't know that it had ten characters, but one of the most powerful um, aspects of it is just these two guys, these two friends, these two you know sort of ordinary people, as you say, with differing um, viewpoints on the world. 
just sort of chatting in this sort of contemporary idiomatic way. Yeah. And there's something looming over this play, you know, the the um the threat of what they're describing, this legend, as you say. Um you've alluded to something that I'd like you to elaborate on. You've you mentioned that the play was, you know, is tragic and um to use the word gruesome again, you know, mm -hmm. gruesome in some ways. Yeah. Um, certainly. Um, but you also said that it was funny and there's a certain charm to it. Um, I'm just curious about combining those. Was that the intention from the beginning or did it, did the, the idea to meld something that was so um, horrific with something that was comic um, evolve during the course of the writing? No, I think, I think it always, for me, it always kind of starts with, with, a, a comic edge, um, no matter how dark it is. And oftentimes the darker it is, the, the funnier it can be. Um, and um, so it, it always began like that. And, you know, one of the peculiar things about that play was that, um, and I, part, part of the success of that play, a big part of it is that I had the opportunity to develop it with two gifted actors, Arian Moyad and Omar Metwali. And it's the only play that I've worked on that the two actors that first read the first draft ended up doing it multiple times. They did it both at the Atlantic Theater in New York, and then they did it at Steppenwolf Theater a couple years later in Chicago. Um, and we actually, the three of us, went to India together to visit the Taj Mahal and do some more research together. And so their contributions um, as actors and as dramaturgs, much like at Bengal Tiger, but I think even in a more intense and long-term way, was, uh, you know, a real factor for this, but um, we always thought like there's this, the second scene of the play opens in a room full of blood. And we realize that these two guys, these low level guards have been, you know, given the unfortunate task of behanding these thousands of laborers. And it's absurd, you know, this could never actually happen in the course of a night, but the we use the theatrical conceit that it did and that they're now, dazed and confused in this dungeon that's they're covered in blood and like they're 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 walking through like you know ankle deep you know rivers of blood in this room and cleaning it up and i because it's absurd i i always found this darkly funny um and i forget sometimes that um not everyone has shares that dark sensibility with me. And uh, the first few days of previews, um, people were really horrified by it and really taken like, like it was, we had people every day, we had people had to leave the theater to like, cause they were going to be sick. And um, I, I was always surprised by that, but I also had, it was like, it served as a reminder for me that like, um, maybe my sensibilities can get a little too dark because I find humor in such, darkness and to me everything is like not a joke but like that there's there is there's like a, a comic absurdity to this theatrical engagement um you see it in bengal tiger you see it in this play you see it in gruesome playground injuries like that there is there's violence there's gore but there's um there's like this human comedy happening in the midst of it and um i'm very attracted to that and I find that some people are, and some people are decidedly not. And um, that's just one of those things that like, maybe my plays are not for them. Yeah, as simple as that. Um, you're not writing for everybody. It's true though, when the, the scene that takes place in ankle deep blood, um, I, I do remember, cause I saw that play twice too, people leaving, but I also remember people chuckling. And I think that had to do with the, the character development um, we, we know these guys by this point. And so them, those two human beings being in this horrific situation, there was something a little bit, well, darkly comic, as you say about it. It's really a beautiful play. Um, Thank you. Congratulations on that, Rajiv. The next, next step at the Atlantic um, for Rajiv was um, Describe the Night, which um, is a sprawling, epic play it covers 80 years i believe 90 90 90 years yeah. yeah yeah um there are multiple sets of characters in some ways um for me it was like a puzzle putting the pieces together i feel like i understood it much better the second time i thought it i mean the second time i saw it 
can you um, describe describe yeah. the night a little bit and um, uh, I guess talk about its larger themes? Absolutely. Um, the 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 journey of that play is probably the most interesting and circuitous journey of any play of mine. Um, it, I guess you could say it began when um, I was like just walking down the street in the East Village, you know, those guys that sell books on the street. I was always stop and look around for books. And I came across this slim book that said 1920 Diary by Isaac Babel. And I had read Babel in college in my Russian lit course, and I liked his stories. I didn't know much about him. But I'm always interested in diaries. Um, I keep one, and and I was, I, I was like, oh, this is cool. I like, I want to read diaries by writers, and I and his was particularly uh, impactful to me. It was very beautiful. It was written in fragments. Only fragments of it survive. Much much of it is destroyed. He ended up being killed um, by Stalin's police, and then his his story becomes very interesting. But I. I was interested in that diary and I was, I, I was like, maybe I should write a play about Isaac Babel, but that just kind of like was in my back pocket and I, I, I didn't think much about it at all. Um, the diary was because he kept it while he was part of the Russo-Polish War in 1920. He was a basically an embedded journalist uh, writing for the state newspaper. And so he was traveling with all these soldiers through a real gruesome and, and traumatizing war. And, um, I and it, and it was this this journal was like basically his notes for his most successful and well known collection of stories called Red Cavalry. Um, I didn't think anything of it. I I was like maybe this is something I could write about someday. And then when I was doing Bengal Tiger in Los Angeles, um, I found this news article that had which had just happened where this plane had crashed in Russia in Smolensk, and it, the plane this was in two thousand and ten. This plane had crashed, and and it, and the president of Poland, his wife, and all the top levels of the government were on this plane, and it had crashed mysteriously in Russia. They were on their way to Smolensk, Russia, to commemorate this massacre called the Katyn massacre, where twenty thousand Poles had been, you know, executed by Soviet troops in nineteen forty, and it was like this really surreal story. I couldn't believe it was it wasn't getting more attention, and. Um, when they in in the news they said you know this um, this brings back these age old conflicts between Russia and Poland and I was like oh yeah just like Isaac Babel just like the 1920 Russian Russo Polish War and I was like oh maybe there's a way of connecting these two stories of 1920 and 2010 and around that time Giovanna Sardelli who is a director I've collaborated with a lot she invited me to be part of this program at NYU's grad acting school where they do a sort of joint stock process where you come in with like a, a shard of an idea and you work with the actors there, the third year acting students in the graduate program and they help you kind of research your idea and like they'll go out and they'll do all this research and they'll come back and then through through Giovanna's like help, they'll kind of do improv and, and perform their research for me. And so I said, look, I want to write a play about Isaac Babel, the Russo-Polish War, and this plane crash in Smolensk. And then through their help, I realized that there was a third part of the story, which was about Vladimir Putin and about him being a KGB agent in the 1980s in um, Dresden. And so those became these three tentpole stories. And uh, the, the trick was, how do, what do they all have in common? And you're right, it's like a puzzle. And, um, and so that it, it became, you know, so it's, it actually started in, at NYU in this small black box theater. And I wrote it, and it, it, for the first draft of it, the first time we performed it there, it was really long. It was longer than you remember. It was like four hours long. And, um, and it was in 2000 and I want to say 14. And so there were still two years left of the Obama administration. And it was like this sprawling piece about what what truth is and what you know what how do we understand what is truth and what is not truth and how does the state often manipulate that and particularly how did uh, Russia and the Soviet Union um, distort truth and therefore history and is Vladimir Putin still doing that 
And was Vladimir Putin responsible or not for this um, plane crash? And is the plane crash, was it an accident or was it an assassination of the entire government of Poland? And these are questions that still have not been answered. And depending on who you ask, they'll have very specific answers. And there's a lot of uh, Poles who believe it was an accident. And there are a lot of Poles who believe it was not an accident. And this became really fascinating to me, but it didn't seem that current or that you know urgent of a story. But then after the election of Donald Trump in 2016, um, and the emergence of, in our news cycle, of Russia's involvement, um, potential involvement in that, and the way that Donald Trump sort of reflected the, uh, in his rhetoric, the same sort of disdain for truth and facts that Putin and much of the, you know, the, the leadership of Russia over the course of the last 90 years has, um, suddenly the, the, the play, which I had written two years prior and had just sat there, um, leapt off the page. And when we did a reading of it at the Alley Theater, who had sort of co-commissioned it, um, the audience was like, holy shit, like, <laughs> when did you write this? And I was like, I actually wrote it two years ago, and it didn't have any idea that it would make, have this sort of relevance now. And, um, and that, that was part of the magic of that show, is that it, it, it ended up being written at the right time and produced at the right time. You know, con congratulations on that piece. As I mentioned, I, I find it endlessly fascinating, <laughs> and I was really um, pleased that it got the recognition it deserved um, with the OB Award. So um, thank you. Congrats on that. It's funny, I was reading Atlantic magazine and came across um, the word disinformation, which we're really used to now. And it's such a strange word because it's like an oxymoron, but usually oxymorons are two words, like an adjective and a noun. Right. Yeah. You have like an oxymoron in one word. So I looked it up and do you do you know that its origin, its etymology is actually Russian? No. <laughs> in Russia in the 1950s. That's interesting. This information, yeah. Um, which both plays, and I don't want to put guards and describe the night into the same category, but there's, there's thematic parallels to them. Yeah. Uh, they're both, ov I don't want to say overtly, though they're both, well, they're different. Um, guards is more obliquely political, and I, I feel and describe the night is more overtly political but they are deeply political plays in various ways and maybe contradictory ways. Can you talk about writing political plays in this world we live in? Yeah, I mean, I, it goes back to me, like when, when I, I, I've had, I've had the um, benefit and the, the blessing to have had some excellent teachers in my life. Um, one of them was a man named Stephen Bauer, who is uh, a fiction professor of mine at Miami University in Ohio as an undergrad, who exposed me and my classmates to a sort of, um, a, a, to, to, he exposed and encouraged us to, to, to look at writing and look at uh, a, the place of an artist from a political viewpoint. And at that point, as an undergrad and as a person who had no discipline and who had lived in Ohio his whole life and had lived through a time of, you know, <laughs> as opposed to like the, the kids growing up now, going to high school and college, like, you know, me growing up in the 80s and 90s, like there was, there was so little immediate threat to our lives and so little, um, it, it was hard to get a sense of like how our lives were political, at least it was for me at that age. And, um, and then that grew as I, as I went to the Peace Corps and I came back and I moved to New York and then 9-11 happened and the war, the war in Iraq happened and suddenly our, our lives felt more overtly political, but it's still, it, it's a trick to, to translate that into, you know, entertainment, um, even if it's artful entertainment. And, um, and so I would say that like, and I had other professors at NYU who also were encouraging of this, especially during that time. And that's where Bengal Tiger came from. And I also wrote a couple other pieces at NYU. And I, I started to realize that whenever I was writing politically, I had, I had more juice. I had more to work with because the, the stakes <laughs> become so much clearer when you're writing from a political point of view and you're writing about sort of the, the way that like, you know, our lives are shaped by powers beyond us. And I think the, the best example of it in many ways is still Bengal Tiger because 
you know, the thing about Bengal tiger is that it, because it, it has a tiger as it's like kind of, uh, primary character, the, the, the character who guides us through this, this world is a tiger, uh, not a human being. Um, it, that opened up an opportunity for me to, to, to speak with some authority because I wasn't actually taking the perspective of a U.S. soldier um, because that, that, would be, that would be difficult, even though I did have soldiers in the play, or an Iraqi, that would be more difficult, even though I did have uh, Iraqis in the play. But to, to take a, uh, an animalistic approach, a primal approach, um, opened up the idea for me. And, and I think that like for me in all these plays, um, I, I, I like to think about the primal versus the political. And, you know, both these things shape our lives. Primal, primal forces and political forces guide us, um, force us into places. Primal meaning like your own psychologies, your own pathologies, your own, um, the, 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 the deep suspicions and curiosities in your soul that drive you towards something or, or repel you from something. And then the political forces, the forces that you have no control over, but that are guiding you as well, um, whether it's the president of the United States, whether it's the president of Russia, whether it's the emperor of India, um, whether it's, you know, a soldier in a, in a field. Um, these, are, these are also things that, that, that immediately bring, <laughs> uh, bring into relief um, sometimes life or death stakes. And I think that I, whenever I'm talking to younger writers, I'm always asking them, what are the stakes of this? What, what, is, what happens if your protagonist doesn't get what they want? Are they just disappointed? Or are the, is their life ruined or ended? Um, those are stakes. And so like, I, I like, I, I find that I'm, I'm writing maybe the, my, 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 my truest material when I'm engaged in some sort of political slash historical approach it's really beautiful rajiv it's really an eloquent um description pressy of your plays um which i find continuously rewarding and have since way back when <laughs> so i just want to um congratulate you again on not just your success but the fact that you're able to sort of honor a very distinct unique artistic vision continuously over years now and through a series of plays. So I'm glad that, you know, you have those opportunities as a writer, and I'm glad that we audiences have an opportunity to experience them. I mean that sincerely from the bottom of my heart. I look forward to each of your plays. I've looked up the new plays you're working on, and they sound um, equally um, distinct and compelling. So congrats. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy holidays. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with Queens Theatre audiences today and uh, best in the new year, Rajiv. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for talking with me today and for supporting me from, you were the, you were the first person, you know, who, who really sought me out and, and put my work up. And I really will always remember that and appreciate it as well. My buddy, Brian, who still thinks it's the uh, high water mark of my career. So <laughs> we both appreciate that. Tell Brian things. That's great to hear. I really yeah. appreciate that. You take care. You too, Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Rajiv. And thank you so much at home for watching. In January, Playwright to Playwright moves to the third Tuesday of each month. On January 19th, we'll welcome Jalissa J. Robinson, whose play Delivery was featured in the New American Voices Summer Virtual Reading Series. Until then, follow Queen's Theatre on all social media, and on our website at www.queenstheater.org for information on all our upcoming Theater at Home projects. Until next time, I'm Rob Urbanati, Director of New Play Development at Queen's Theater. Stay safe, happy holidays, and happy new year.